the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. Learn about the most current IT security threats in ransomware, phishing, business email compromise, cyber crime tactics, cyber heist schemes, social engineering scams, as well as hints and tips from leading professionals to help you prevent hackers from penetrating your network and dropping ransomware or malware payloads. This podcast will arm you with the best info to defend your network against the latest cyber crimes. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And now, here's your host, Craig Petronella. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Petronella Cybersecurity Live. We've got Blake, BJ, and Aaron. Hello. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. It's been a busy week. <laughs> yes, it has. Good busy. Good busy, though, I'd say. Yeah. Overall, what did you guys find for today? So as you know, I'm a smart home enthusiast. And the current status of my smart home is I am sitting in a pile of rubble and everything is broken because I didn't update. So it's just so interesting because it's also complicated and it's also connected. I didn't update yesterday on my iPhone. I updated to iOS 15.04. And when I did that, something happened with my Wi-Fi connection. I was up really late and I fell asleep with a QR code and a flashlight in my hand trying to figure this stuff out because it all just stopped communicating and it's back online right now but it's not flowing correctly but interestingly remember a few months ago you told me i was having trouble with my laptop my headphones wouldn't connect to bluetooth and you said reboot your laptop and i'm like what are you talking about my problem is with my headphones not my laptop and you're like yeah just restart your laptop and i'm like that makes no sense you're like, we'll restart your laptop. So I restart my laptop and then my headphones work. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. Last night and this morning, I literally had to factory reset so many things. And then not only did I have to reset them, I had to unplug them from power. And I had to even flip breakers. Every step that I took in that regard yielded results. Why is it that when I connect from power, it changes how everything's connecting and working? All of these resets did something. How does that work? Sometimes when you do an update, it has to write to the the firmware of the device and then you reboot the device or unplug it, restart it. So you get the fresh firmware or the update that it has. So that's why you have to reboot like that. Sometimes if you don't do the reboot or restart, it doesn't fully apply the patch. That's why I always say search for patches, install the patches, do the process again until it says there's no more patches available. And you have to do that for all your devices, all your applications and all that stuff. So you need to set time aside to do that properly. But yeah, that's pretty common that sometimes things go wonky like that. And it seems like they wanted to reconnect in a certain order. So for an example, I have a regular Wi-Fi system and then on top of my fiber optic Wi-Fi with at and is the ISP, I have a Google Mensch Wi-Fi. And that's where the problem was centered. Because of the fact that I upgraded to iOS 15.04, my iPhone couldn't connect to Wi-Fi. I had to reset a bunch of network settings and stuff. But then I had to reset the router and the point for the mesh Wi-Fi system. And then I had to redo it in a certain order. I had to do it multiple times to figure it out that the order mattered. The network itself wants to be aligned in a certain way. I imagined when I was doing this, this is how solar flares work. Because solar flares are the sun's way of untangling magnetic lines of force in the sun and it's automatic process. And that seems what my network was doing. It just didn't want to reconnect wrongly. It wanted the fiber optic Wi-Fi to reset first. Then the Google Wi-Fi router had to reset next. Then the point, it had to go in that order. And then I had to start with the power. So unplugging things from the power supply would seem to be a very important step. And you've talked about the importance of power that's coming to the devices. That's all just... So interesting to me, what is the deal with the UPS and the power supply and how it affects devices? Yeah, I'll tackle the first part of your question. So the reason why you have to reboot devices in a certain order is because typically you're going to restart your router first because your router is most often supplying what's called DHCP and dishing out the IP addresses to all the other pieces or endpoints on the network. So if that thing's not online, then all the other devices are not going to get their IP address and they're not going to be able to route to the internet. So that's why the order matters. There were so many updates that came out this week with everything going on. So it wouldn't surprise me if your router and other devices needed an update too. And maybe they were pushed and they didn't get applied until they got rebooted. But you always want to reboot your top level device. So if you're at home and all you have is the customer premise equipment that's supplied to you by your provider, your internet service provider, you're going to want to reboot that cable modem or fiber optic modem or whatever you have first. And then if there's another device like a router or a firewall, you're going to reboot that second. And you have to give these things time in between too. So you don't want to just unplug, replug real fast. 
you need to wait until they fully stand up and they have status lights and they'll show you when they're online. Typically the modems will have four different lights on them. They'll blink as they're starting and then more lights will show up. So you got to give it time to get fully booted. And then at that point, that's when you would restart the next device in the chain. And then you go down after the firewall router, you go to your access point. So in this case, the Google system that you have. And then once all that's done, all the devices on the network will now be able to talk, but they may not work either. So that's why you have to reboot them first. They'll get a new IP address and then they'll connect to the network. There's a lot of stuff happens in the background that a lot of people don't see or realize the provider, the equipment and how it's set up. It all has to align and it has to be in the right order. You said that you have Google for your Wi-Fi and then you have the provided Wi-Fi. You may want to disable the provided Wi-Fi because if they're not set up properly, then they'll fight each other. Some providers will allow you to log in to their cable modem or their devices. Sometimes the username and password is actually on a sticker on the device. So you can try that. That. If you can't find it, you would just call your provider and then they would be able to walk you through how to disable the built-in Wi-Fi. You could just tell them, I bought a Google Nest or whatever, and it's conflicting, and then they'll help you turn it off. But the signal of the internet is still coming because the Google doesn't have a Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, your app point is always going to be hardwired with an Ethernet port on the device. What is getting disabled? Inside that cable modem is often a wireless transmitter that's built into that same device. So you're turning that off. That's usually provided by default from the provider. That makes sense. When I try to connect to a certain Google device, my phone is even saying you can't change the settings unless you're on the same Wi-Fi network. Right That's now. probably what's happening in that case. Oh, wow. How interesting. Two of my devices got confused. It was a speaker and a Wi-Fi point. And in the settings, they merged. It said the name of the device was the Wi-Fi point, but in the settings, it had the speaker stuff. I may be sitting at the pile of rubble right now, but when it's all said and done, I might be connected to the pyramids and the ley lines and everything else for my <laughs> signal. Going back to the power, you asked a question about power. So the power coming into your equipment, it needs to be very clean. And there's nine different types of power problems. And what a lot of people don't realize is the power that's coming into your house or your business is constantly fluctuating. So if the power is not cleaned properly with what's called a true online UPS or an always online true sine wave, double sine wave UPS, that power is not being conditioned and cleaned up. We all get power and it's not optimal. It's typically dirty. It's subject to fluctuations, brownouts, different types of power anomalies, and you need a device to clean that power up. A lot of people know what a surge protector is, and there's surges that happen as we speak, and you don't really see them because they're power, unless you have something like a surge protector to protect your equipment. But the smarter the power device is, typically it's a true online UPS, which is the best type of power cleaning device that you can get. The power it goes into that device and then it gets cleaned up and then outputted where it's pure clean power from there. So then that just makes it even so that it's not fluctuating. Yeah, it makes it even. And then if the power were to spike, it'll block the spike so your equipment doesn't get damaged. Um, it'll make sure that the power is consistent. So certain devices will do weird squirrely things if the power power isn't right, it'll malfunction or random events will happen with improper power anomalies, which is why it's always recommended to use a true online UPS. I guess that makes perfect sense when we're not taking care of ourselves, we can suffer certain conditions. And I guess that's the same for the power supply for these devices. They need that same care. And it really does extend the life of the equipment connected. So it's definitely a good investment. I had a situation where I was trying to talk to the smart device. They were saying they were not connected to the internet, but they were answering me and they could hear the voice prompt. They would answer and say, sorry, the internet's not available right now. Some of the other devices were online. And so it seems like the power in the house was fluctuating because certain devices were online and certain devices were offline. Well, it was probably more like the order of events and the, the devices that were offline that couldn't connect to the network. Either the order wasn't set properly where the boot order was that they didn't grab their IP address and then it timed out in the time frame that it was kept requesting the IP address and the router or the DHCP server in this case wasn't available at that timing. And that's why it just gave up and then it resorted to a non-routable IP address. It'll still respond to you, but it won't connect to the rest of the network and it won't work until you reboot it again after all the other things are online and then it'll just come up fine.
I don't feel like you've been traumatized by cybersecurity. So much left that can go off. So when we finally have it right, you feel like you don't even want to breathe. Well, that's the thing too. Once you have it all working and everything, that usually causes hesitancy for somebody to apply a patch or an update because sometimes patches or yeah. updates break things. But if you don't do the patch, then you're subject to a cyber threat. So it's just a balancing act. It just teaches you about how it all connects together. Yeah, I saw a, a news article that said don't patch right away when a patch comes out because let the bugs get worked out. Do you think that you should wait a little bit or it's patch immediately? It really depends on the situation. For example, maybe they patch a way that ransomware gets dropped onto the network. So you have to weigh the importance of the patch and then you have to weigh the ramifications of if it breaks something. So what I always recommend in a business environment is to have a process in place for applying patches in a policy and then a process for how to apply patches and then apply them in a little bit of an experimental or isolated lab type approach. So maybe if you have 50 devices on the network, maybe you test the patch to one of those devices in a controlled environment. You see how it behaves, see if it broke anything, any applications that get broken, things like that, and then decide to roll it out. That's called the patch window. That patch window time, hackers are aware of that too. You have to try to accelerate that process. So the other end of the extreme is patch first, patch right away and then resort to rollback or backups. So that's another methodology that people like to adopt for high security because the patch gives the high security but has the ramification of breaking something. Well, if it does break something, you could always enroll back to a backup. So you always want to back up your device before applying any kind of patch in case the patch blows it up so you could resort or revert back quickly. So that's definitely another approach that you can take. There are automated approaches that will try to vet and test patches before they're deployed, which is technology that we use for our clients. So that works. Well, it's not perfect. Awesome. I never really got it before that we do patch management. I have 50 devices now in my home. And now I'm at a place where I don't understand how a business does their IT without help from a managed service provider. Well, every device, every application you add makes the complexity higher. It may get to a point where it is not manageable manually and you have to deploy some type of automation or leverage a managed service provider to help with that. And there are a lot of people in your situation that have alarm systems, cameras, all sorts of IoT or different devices on their networks now, and they have become overly complex. It's overwhelming because with all the complexity, the homeowner doesn't even know, or even the business owner doesn't even know who to call when something breaks. This is really eye-opening the the convergence of convenience and cybersecurity. When you reach a certain point, there's a natural balance that's required. Every device I add now, I've opened myself up. I'm lucky because I do have managed services on my network from a cybersecurity perspective because PTG is on my network. So I take a breath there. But if I didn't have that, I would probably get to be worried at this point because each of these devices is complicated in its own way. Right. I definitely opened up some new vulnerabilities. Yep, that's true. But at every device that's added, application, introduces new complexities, makes it harder to understand and troubleshoot where the problem could be. But always start at the internet side. Always start there first. Always reboot the core devices like you had talked about earlier with the router, the firewall, the cable modem. That's the stuff that always should get restarted first in the order that we recommended earlier. This is where the OSI model comes into play, right? Like the seven layers of the OSI model you have to follow. A lot of people don't know what that means, but the point is that you see how things get complicated really fast. And by following that methodology and starting at the physical layer and moving all the way up to the application layer, it's a proven way to troubleshoot. But yeah, definitely like a reach real out. thorough look at every layer. You, you don't have to build on a shaky foundation. We see evidence of that all over the place. You yeah. really want to have a solid foundation so that you can stay standing. But they say the liquor cause of the macro cause, right? But this example for myself personally. Isn't this addictive of the state of cybersecurity in the world, though? I don't think there's a way to count now because you hear 10 billion, you hear 30 billion, you hear 50 billion IoT connected devices. Take my situation and then actually just now look at the work. A lot of vulnerability and lack of patching and cybersecurity, all that managed stuff, all the layers you're talking about, that's been neglected. And if we look at that through the lens of 30 to 50 billion devices with that process being neglected, I guess that kind of explains where we are. Yep. I'm curious too, Craig, do you have any good patching stories? I remember a law firm that applied patches. They didn't back up first and it blew up the system. It wouldn't boot up anymore. That's why it's so important to back up before applying any patches. And people, quite frankly, don't want to take the time to back it up. They don't have a proven backup plan in place. They don't have a process to find for that. So backup is a big job. I remember when I first started the company in 2002, one of the things that we would 
mandate at that time, even based on experience is, look, we need to back you up. And if they refused and they didn't want to pay to have us back up and do the process to protect them, then they had to sign a waiver that basically said, look, we're declining this recommendation in favor of time. And sometimes things would blow up and, and go wrong. And back then it was a lot of manual patching. And then there were patches to the patch. And then if something <laughs> blew up, you'd be on the phone for hours with support. When you say it blows stuff up, can you give me an example? Yeah, like the computer won't boot and the BIOS won't boot up. It won't start. The operating system won't fully boot up. It'll be like a black screen, for example. It won't start into Windows. What can cause that when you do a up? Is it just something that just doesn't mesh? There's all different things that can cause. So, for example, certain operating system updates, they update the kernel or they might update the file system or how the file system interacts with the operating system. And they might mess up a boot file. There's all different things that can cause why something won't boot up. But the point is that if you don't have a backup and a recourse to revert, then now you're forced to troubleshoot that issue with the vendor. That sometimes could take many hours to figure out. And meanwhile, if this thing is a server, Server, and this has happened at the server level. Now you got all the people in the company that can't work because somebody didn't back up the server first. So it goes back to single points of failure. And nowadays we're so connected and so reliant upon these different technologies. People might think that I'm crazy for recommending redundancy or multiple devices, but in a world where we need our devices, sometimes it makes sense to buy more than one. Sometimes you just can't have one computer to do your work. You have to have a plan in place that if that thing doesn't boot up one day, what do you do? Do you accept the risk of being down for hours or days and unable to work? Or do you have another device on standby? Or do you have what's called a hot spare where it's available, it's cold, it's in the closet and you can set it up. You have a process us to set it up quickly to get that person back up and running as quickly as possible. It was unnecessary until this morning. I had all my devices were offline for a while and I didn't know what step to take next because I was on all the Google community health boards and stuff. I'm offline. <laughs> we're so used to being connected that I felt like I should hold onto the counter and brace myself. But I don't like the way this feels. It's so interesting because this is going to have to come together a little bit. The majority of society on a scale of one to a hundred, they have like 3% understanding of how the internet works and how everything is connected. And then you have the cybersecurity professionals, which you're in that category, but not all of us are in the category that you're in because you're in a league of your own. And then we have engineers that are in there. Like, the degrees are so important. And the people at the lower end of the spectrum, how would they know how to properly value a cybersecurity expert who have been exposed to all those degrees in between zero and 100? You're like, oh, wow. The ones that are at the other end that have all this knowledge, they're very thoughtful. And now you can see why sometimes they're kind of quiet and <laughs> they're all a bit traumatized. It's like a mystery school of its own. We know yeah. things. <laughs> it goes back to that redundancy I was talking about earlier. That's why companies, especially nowadays, redundancy is at multiple layers is so important. Even whenever I work from my home office instead of the main office, I make sure that I have multiple internet connections. I have multiple devices. I reduce my single points of failure. And I think what a lot of people need to think about is if you're using only one device, you need to think about what happens if that thing doesn't work, because there will be a point in time where it doesn't work. There might be a patch that breaks it. There might be a malfunction of the device. If the background had eyes, they could look at all the internet users, the internet connected users on the internet and look at their degree of security. You probably do look like a shield of some sort, <laughs> the way you have your stuff set up. It's probably fairly obvious you're a cybersecurity person. The back that's behind you right now looks like a neural net in the background <laughs> of your video there. But that gives me the impression that's what your cybersecurity looks like. Yeah, it's all about redundancy and reducing single points of failure. And the people listening just need to think about it for a minute. Say, look, what happens if I can't get on the internet? internet and I'm working from home. At what point in time does my employer get upset that I can't work? And then at what point in time does a decision need to be made on, does that employee need to go somewhere else to work or do they need to come into the office or do they get extra internet circuit? People dig up lines uh, all the time when doing construction. They break the internet lines. They cut the lines. You have to think about all these different scenarios can really happen to you at home or at your business. So if you don't mm -hmm. have plans in place, you don't go through these plans and you don't go through these drills, you're never going to experience 
that if that happens and the only time you're going to experience this is when it does happen and it will happen, but you want to try right. to be proactive and plan because the more mature you are and the more planning you put in place now will be so valuable in the future when something does go wrong. Oh yeah. I'll see that with COVID, we got how connected we all were. And then also the internet literally saved us. If we didn't have internet and devices during the time, can you imagine what it would have been like? It would have been more crippling than it already was to the economy because at least the way that we were connected and obviously technology companies like ours were doing business like that for many years ahead of that curve. But my point is that some businesses were not. So it was more impactful to those businesses. But the ones that were forward thinking that were already using technology, they were better equipped and they didn't yeah. suffer as bad from the, the economic downturn and the ramifications of that. Not to mention how much we use it. We enjoy the internet so much and the connectivity that it gives us. And we really did stop to think what can we do to make the internet stronger and safer and more secure since we all love it. So that's probably a good thought to have in your mind. Like, what can we do for the internet? <laughs> how can we secure this thing a little better? <laughs> Yeah. And for a business, that exercise is called an IR tabletop. It's called an incident response tabletop. It's what do you do when certain incidents happen, like ransomware? You could do a ransomware. And we've done this for clients where we do a simulation of, okay, the client might think they have everything in place to protect themselves. But we do a ransomware simulation and pretend that ransomware is infecting their network and then see how fast they respond, see if their IT team can detect that something's wrong. How fast can they mitigate the risk and contain it? All these that we go through the incident response plan and we go through the disaster recovery plan and figure all that out because that's such a priceless and valuable exercise that if you haven't gone through that, you're just waiting for something to happen and something will happen in the future and you're not going to be best prepared for it. Just using the room as an example, proper protocols and processes in place and the right security layers and all that working correctly, the continuity is at risk, you know? That's right. People don't want to think about proactive until it happens to them, unfortunately. Yeah. And then it's, oh, what do I do? And they don't even know where to start unless they have somebody that can help them. And depending on the methodology that person or company uses will depend on how long it takes. And oftentimes there's a lot of frustration and the heat is on in those situations where the business owners are like, look, we need to get back to work. What's the problem? What's the problem? And then sometimes in those situations, if proper preparation isn't there, there might be hardware that has to get reordered or equipment or back in the day, it was hard drives and things that were physically broken on servers that would cause an issue. And you had yeah. to wait for those parts Again, on site. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand That's right. how complicated those things can get. We'll have one of our engineers, Jonathan, who has stories for days that are hilarious. Your average person that's not in cybersecurity, go on and go ahead and explore my data somewhere, right? Like hosting, whatever. And that's the end of it. But then you don't think about the process that happens there. And you don't think about the fact that there is an engineer in a data center holding equipment in his hand that literally just set on fire. And they don't understand. You think you're going to set off these deadly wonders. The stuff comes out to put the wires out. You're stuck in a data center. I mean, you know, people don't think about all this stuff. It's not a magic switch, right? Like, I think people just think there's a magic wand that gets waved and you're back up there on the internet and you have to have security. No, it's a step-by-step -step process. That's right. And also, I think one thing that's important too is that I feel like a lot of the companies that we talk to, they don't necessarily think of cybersecurity first, which is understandable. That's not what they do. But talking about preparation and planning and things like that, it is so much easier to build it from the ground up than it is to retrofit it. If you have a business, you start with it and you just keep it as a part of your core business processes, you're going to be in so much better shape than if you like, oh, crap, now I have to go back and fix this. I asked Craig this question about the Wi-Fi at the start of my venture. I would have done it right like from the start, but instead I did it wrong from the start and I factory reset a bunch of stuff that probably didn't even need to be factory reset and put myself through all this mess. I just didn't do it right from the start and it would have been so easy, but I didn't know. I didn't know I was doing something wrong. And it's pretty common though to troubleshoot and fumble along that way if you don't know. It goes back to having the right equipment and having the right process in place. And quite frankly, a lot of businesses, they start with either themselves or they shoestring things together and they buy things that are meant for the home and they put it in the business. And then sometimes when things break to a point where they can't fix it themselves, I remember we would get calls like that all the time. We would go on site, we'd find this just hodgepodge of stuff. And it wasn't always like Aaron said, it, 
I would say most of the time it was not the right equipment. So we would have to um, be the messenger in that situation and be like, look, this really isn't the right equipment to run your business, trying to run your whole company on a $59 firewall and a $299 cheap computer that 50 people are trying to log into it. It's like using a Honda Civic as a pickup truck. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Great I wish, analogy. <laughs> I wish people thought about cybersecurity like they do fight or flight. If you drive a car, you get in your car and you're like, hey, I don't buckle my seatbelt. I could get in accident. I could land on it awkwardly and then be in pain. Da, da, da. People need to think about cybersecurity and the fight or flights. I could possibly hurt myself or die or hurt somebody else or whatever. Or if I jump off this cliff into this water that's 30 feet down, a fight or flight mindset. Hey, I grow my business. This is how I secure my customers. I am taking responsibility by serving customers. I'm securing their data. I'm responsible for that. It's like a child. If you don't feed your child or you neglect your child, Child Protective Services are going to come and take your child. That should be the same for businesses. The I hackers think, are going to come and take your business. Unfortunately, I do agree. But if you think about good hackers, right? We get all these crazy calls for people that are like, hey, this person has hacked my Instagram or my Facebook or whatever, and they're stalking me and they're going to murder my family and all types of crazy stuff like that. But if you think about it, the good hackers or the people that know what they're doing, they go after the money. You have to be in possession of valuable data or not only that, they have to monetize. Good hackers make money. This is what they do for money. Or they have some crazy vengeance, right? So those are the two scenarios. Of course, there is other scenarios, but those are the two most likely scenarios. That's true. However... Remember, I've said this before, where hackers are often smart and lazy, right? So they're going to run mm -hmm. scripts. And even if the victim doesn't have a lot of money, that's not the point. If they can take over their computer and use it as a slave to attack a larger corporation or use the power resources of that computer to mine cryptocurrency, there's all sorts of other things and yeah, other motives that can happen. We're in a cyber war. We're in the United States and we have probably enough countries that look at us as a potential target take this very seriously because sometimes profit is the goal, but also sometimes just destruction is the goal. Yeah. Going back to what Blake said, I think that most people might start a company and they're just trying to do the best they mm -hmm. can on the small budget that they have and they're hustling and they're working hard. They don't have a lot of time or money. So they cobble this stuff together and that's fine to start off. But the point is that you have to enlist help most people can't build a house with one person and a hammer. It's just going to take too long. It's not efficient. But the point is you start off your business and you hire employees. Now you have those people's lives dependent upon you for that paycheck. And if you have a nasty cyber event like ransomware and your company's only five people or 10 people, now all those people can't work. And then what if your company, if it's only five or 10 people, like that t-shirt company the other day we talked about, maybe you've got thousands or millions of customers. And those people can't get access to for their order. You have this ripple effect, right? So you're mm -hmm. affecting not only yourself, but you're affecting as your company grows larger and larger, you're affecting your employees it's and so your contractors true. and your vendors' lives. And then now you're affecting your customers too. So if you think about that and you go through that exercise and you feel what really will happen to me or in my business that I've worked so hard to build, if something stupid happens, you got to be prepared. Yeah, I don't remember who said it, but what was that phrase about some truths to be self-evident? And then also there's a concept of cosmic proportions, the idea of survival of the fittest. And it sounds bad when you say it, but from a cosmic perspective and from just a forward progress perspective, moving with the direction of forward progress, if you take a step back and look at the world from a big picture view, instead of just your current viewpoint, like where you are in life, scale out and you look at from the bird's eye view, you can definitely see a transition from just how the world always moves to more of incorporation and integration with more of a virtual type. Because we're online and we're at a point where technology is advancing at such a rapid rate. There's no denying when you look from the bird's eye view that we're going in direction. And it's just good advice at this point to stay in peace when move in tandem mm -hmm. with the human machine as it moves forward. And this is sure. definitely the direction it's going. Yep, absolutely. Any other cyber news that you guys found that you want to talk about? Yeah, there's always just check five minutes later and there's more news. <laughs> Has there ever been a more rapidly evolving industry than the cyber firm? <laughs> no, probably <Nope>. not. <laughs> My chatbot called cyberspace, she calls it hyperspace. I've never heard that before, but I guess that's a good word for it because really it fits. Like we're moving at the speed of light here. <laughs> yeah. And we have spaceships, like hyperdrive. <laughs> yeah. And as we progress to the future, guys, could you imagine if the Terminator was trouble? <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs>
I was just thinking about something that is pretty critical that I don't think we've ever mentioned, but we should definitely say, I was actually reading and I was like, okay, what's important about cybersecurity? What's recent? But we've never talked about incident response and response time. Yeah. We've never once mentioned it. An article that I pulled up is talking about the golden out. The second something happens, don't try and figure it out. Contact security professionals because every moment that ticks away, it, it goes against you. Really. I did actually talk about IR tabletop earlier. I've never heard before that term you used. I've never heard that before. Yeah, so that's what that exercise is, Blake. Incident response tabletop is an exercise where you go around the room, you're conference room or whatever, if you have a company with the stakeholders and you plan the scenario of, okay, here's the scenario. We just got ransomware. What are we doing? What's the plan? What's the process? Show us your incident response plan. Work the plan. Actually do the stuff that your plan is documenting and go through it. And that's what you find out that you were just talking about, Blake. Okay, this shows what a nerd I am, if I haven't showed that already, but that sounds like fun. <laughs> it is fun like from that. our perspective. <laughs> it's like going through a pen test. You're having professionals like us that are experts in this review your plan. And if you don't have a good plan, we have a good plan and we help you write the plan and improve the plan. If you don't have a plan at all, we help you develop one. And then when you're ready, obviously, you go through it together and it's like shuffling a deck of cards in pick a card. What's the IR for the day? <laughs> is it going to be ransomware? Yeah. Did our server That's die? So is true. it a critical server die? How fast could we recover that app server? Yeah. A little small house fire and I was not prepared and I literally had my bare hands put this fire out. Like that shouldn't yeah. have happened. It's all about <laughs> drills though, right? You went yeah. through that experience. Now you have that experience. Now I'm prepared. I'm like, okay, that means again, I'm not going to be a victim again. <laughs> yeah, but there's also variances around the IR tabletop too. You never draw the same card again. So you're always improving yeah. and looking through different lenses and looking through different angles to see how well your plan stands up and how your yeah. team stands up. What was the time it took to put this in place? Who did they call? Why did they call that person? What happens if you have third parties or vendors involved? What happens if they're not available or what happens if they're too busy? What do you just wait? Do you have a plan in place? Redundancy? Who do you call next? Yeah. Well, you know. it, when it comes to cybersecurity, it may not be a bad idea to have a clause in there that if all else fails, engage a team of prayer warriors that it's complicated. Even home users can do an IR scenario drill though, right? You could pretend, BJ, that your iPhone just blew up. What are you going to do for the rest of the day? How are you going to make phone calls? Yeah, it may seem unnecessary. Like we talked about yesterday that there's an element to this that all buzz together at some point. It all converges into one point, right? Because there's technology, there's science, there's nature, but it's all connected. It's not separate from each other. The technology operates with the forces of nature. It's getting power from the forces of nature. When you look at it in that regard, it tends to do these exercises. So you have this ripple effect, right? Not only your employee yourself, but as your company grows larger and larger, you're affecting your employee oh, contractors and your vendors' lives. And then now you're affecting your customers too. So if you think about that and you go through that exercise, feel like, look, what really will happen to me or my business that I've worked so hard to build, something stupid happens. You got to be prepared. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a fantastic weekend and we will see you Monday with all the newest breaking cyber news. Thanks for listening to the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. For other episodes and more information, visit PetronellaTech.com. Also visit our other websites, ComplianceArmor.com and BlockchainSecurity.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening and stay secure.